Welcome to Be Your Own Best Coach with JJ. Today, what we're going to be exploring is knowing your brain. I love this quote by Mikio Kaku, or it could be Mikio Kaku if you're an Aussie. And this quote goes like this. The human brain has a hundred billion neurons. Each neuron connected to 10,000 other neurons. Sitting on your shoulders is the most complicated object in the known universe, which is your brain. So it's so important for us as humans to understand how our brain works. So I want to have a bit of fun today. So I want you to relax, maybe have a piece of paper and a pen. We're going to do some activities together that are fun and teach us a little bit about how our brain works. So the first thing I'm going to do right now is I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to just make sure we've got sound on here. Beautiful. And so I want you to listen to this video. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the basketball. How many passes did you count? The correct answer is 15 passes. But did you see the gorilla? This video is from research by Daniel Simons and Christopher Chabri and how amazing is that? Now, did you see the gorilla? Or did you not see the gorilla? Now, the interesting thing is that our brain is so complex. We get over 2 million pieces of information a second in our brain. So for us to function, we need to delete some of that information. We need to distort some of that information, which means to change it. And we need to generalize some of that information. So if we don't, we'd be just walking, talking, crazing people. Because imagine if you could just take in all of that, those 2 million pieces of information consciously and looking at everything and thinking about the tongue that's sitting in your mouth right now, how your bottom's feeling on your chair, how your feet are feeling on the floor, you're hearing the little drip drip over here of the air diffuser, you're seeing that light over there, you're seeing everything at once and you're not focusing on anything. Our brain is designed to delete some of that information so that we can focus on certain areas and we also generalise some of that information. So we might say, oh, we went to Maya, there's no great service at Maya. There's no great service at, at McDonald's. And we generalise things because that's what our brain does because we've got evidence. Maybe we've got three lots of evidence that say it's true. And so we generalise that. And we distort, we change information. That's why when we have, when there's an accident and there's three different people there, there's three different versions of what actually happened because we're changing that information based on how we filter it. And so I could see a little dog, for instance, and I'll get excited and I'm looking at those big puppy dog eyes and thinking how cute it is. When a person that's exactly in the same situation is looking at the same dog in the same way, might see a vicious dog with, with really scary teeth and looking scary, whereas I see the dog as friendly. And so... It's so important to understand we're taking in all of this information all of the time and we're taking in this information through our senses. So from the what we see, what we hear, what we feel, the feeling, what we taste, what we smell. 
So we're taking in all of these this information through our senses and then it comes through a filter system of what we believe, our past experiences, which then creates our reality. And so the interesting thing is that we, as humans, feel that what, what we see is all there is because that's our sense of reality. It's so like we've got these, these glasses on and that's how we see the world. And sometimes it's really hard to understand that other people are seeing the world differently because we're like, oh, of course, this is how the world is. Of course, this is how it is because this is I'm seeing it. I'm seeing it for myself. But someone else will say, no, I see it differently. And so it's really important for us to understand that we're deleting, distorting, generalizing information all of the time. So I've got another exercise for you guys. And I'm going to play you something. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to listen really carefully because this is a bit of a competition, right? I'm going to see how good your listening skills are. And what I want you to do is listen really, really carefully because I'm going to ask you a question about what the one of the women in this uh, clip, in this audio, says. So I want you to listen really, really carefully to the women in this clip, and then I'll ask you a question. All right, are you ready? Let me play that again. Play that again for you. You missed something. Alrighty. Now the question is, did you hear a man say, I'm a gorilla, I'm a gorilla, I'm a gorilla, I'm a gorilla? Or did you not hear that? Now, if you were doing the task correctly with the instructions that I asked, you would have been focusing on the women's voice. And so therefore you would be deleting anything else out and trying to focus on the women's voice. When that whole time there was someone saying, I'm a gorilla, I'm a gorilla, I'm a gorilla, I'm a gorilla. <laughs> it's a bit of a gorilla theme today, isn't it? The interesting thing is that, that it was always there. It wasn't as though it wasn't there. Now you can re rewind this video and listen again because it was there but maybe you didn't hear it because you were focusing on the women. Now, the interesting thing is, what are we focusing on in life? What is our brain focusing on? Is it focusing on the great stuff that's serving us within our goals? Or is it focusing on stuff that's not serving us and therefore we're getting more of that? So it's a really good, good indication of how our brain works and how we're deleting information all of the time. Now, at school, I, I, if we think about when we're at school, now I think there's some great schools and great teachers around, but there is a lot of conditioning happening at school. So if we think about our brain and we think about school, a lot of times we at school, we are taught to absorb information and remember information. So I'm not sure about what school you went to, but that was definitely the case for me. Here's the information, 
memorize the information, and then I get rewarded from memorizing that information. I, I didn't get rewarded for questioning the information. In fact, I would get the opposite because I was someone when I was young, I'd ask lots of questions and, you know, but, but why, but why is this? Or, but it was like, no, stop being talkative, right? And so from a, a child, you, you learn from a child that maybe questioning isn't a great thing to do at school. And you get conditioned. At school, we're used to working on our own. We've told to work on your own with that rather than collaborating a lot of the time. We, we are learnt to maybe not question, to remember information and not to make mistakes. Mistakes weren't good. And that there's one answer usually that we have to come up with. When life, there might be lots of different answers. And so we, we get this sense of conditioning. And sometimes I feel, not always, but sometimes I feel that the school system can break our learning spirit of being able to explore, to question. And so we get this conditioning at a young age. We're told when we can, when we can have our lunch break, when we need to come back, when we, uh, when, uh, if we need to go to the toilet, we have to put our hand up and ask to go to the toilet. So everything's quite conditioned and structured. Just like an employee, when we start out as an employee, we're conditioned. We're not, we're not, if we don't go to school to learn how to be an entrepreneur, because an entrepreneur is a lot of the times opposite to that. It's about thinking outside the box. It's about questioning what you know what's right or wrong or, or how we can do something better and so we we get this conditioning and and this happens with with advertising as well and marketing our, our brains are conditioned from kids and then as we get older and even as we're we're young we're seeing all of this advertising happening you know have you ever if you're a parent or being with a young child and they get to the counter and they they want that freaking lollipop that's sitting right at the counter and it's right at the the level that your child can grab to pick it up and go I want this and that is all conditioning it's all marketing and advertising to be able to take advantage of how our brain works and so when you look at advertising we know that there's certain shelves that products work better at. We know that uh, when I used to be a trainer at Mars, Mars Chocolate, Mars Bars, we knew that the ends of every aisle were hot property because we that's where a lot of sales would happen, at the ends of the aisle. The music they have in supermarkets and stores make a difference for us to buy or not buy, or to stay in the store longer, to give us, get us in the mood to buy. I talked about the counters going in, you're waiting at the checkout and you see all these quick impulse buys just as you're waiting in the, in the aisle, in the queue. And they're there for you to just, oh, okay, maybe I do want that chocolate bar because they're accessible, they're impulse buys that they know that you'll be standing at that counter for a long time. You'll see that there's lots of mist. If you look at the advertising on healthy, it'll say healthy or it'll be in green. And is it really healthy product or is it just marketed as healthy? And our brain quickly wants to take the easy option and go, oh, that looks healthy and say, yes, it is, and, and then buy it. You might see red price tags and you might make an assumption that it's on sale, but it's actually not on sale, it's a full price, but it's in a red, it's in red. So therefore your brain might make it mean that it's on sale. You might go to a restaurant and there's hard chairs because the hard chairs are making sure that people don't stay in the restaurant too long so that they can get more people in and they can shorten the time span that people are sitting there eating. Even in training rooms, I know myself, I'll say to the guys, make sure that the temperature in the room isn't too hot because we want it cooler so people can learn uh, more effectively. And so we manipulate the environment for our brains. 
And as consumers, it's really important for us to understand that. And as, as business owners, whether it be a product or a service, it's also important for us to understand that as well and use it with caution. And I think that if, if you stick to your values and you're doing the, the best for you, the best for others and the best for the higher, group, higher good, then it's a great thing to utilise these tactics to be able to get your products to sell. But if you're utilising these tactics in in an undesirable way, then I would qu definitely question that. So our brain is really effective at how we process information. And so if I said to you, if I said, say yes to stepping up right now, say yes to being all you can be, say yes to you what and I and then I and then I will say what do you need to say and your head is saying yes your brain is saying yes because I've said the same word repetitively three times our unconscious mind loves repetitive words three times and so again with marketing they take advantage of that and, and as a speaker, you can take advantage of that when you want to teach someone uh, something in your rooms. But it's really important that you we understand that that is programming. And we, we're getting programmed from every different angle, from school, from what we watch on TV, from the news, from magazines we look at, all of these it, it, touch points of information that goes in your brain. And the more you get that repetitive message, the more it sticks. So it's really important to understand what message is going in your brain and saying, do I want those messages in my brain and questioning that. So the words that you hear and the repetitiveness will make things stick. And that could be, maybe it's not just what you listen to either. It could be a picture at the back saying yes, and I'm saying yes, and then I tell you a story about someone that says yes, and then you might see a clip that says yes, and we might do a little bit of an exercise and we say yes, and so you're hearing yes, 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 seeing yes, feeling yes, saying yes out, out, out loud, which I do a lot in my live events I'll say so what do you what do, what do I just say and I'll say like that and you go yes and so you're actually saying that that same word over and over and over again until it sticks so it's really important to understand the rep repetitiveness of a of a word or information that will stick the other thing that's important is the word sequence how it's structured how information is structured when I went to the US, I was really surprised at how many ads were on in regards to drugs. And so it was, it was like a pill for freaking everything. And I'm like, wow, this it was shocking the first time I went to the US. I'm thinking, wow, I'm someone that doesn't even take a pen at all for a headache unless I'm dying. Uh, and here's these, all these drugs about I can fix this with a pill. And it was really interesting to watch how they were marketed. Now, if I had a, let me say this is, this is a, a, let me pretend this is a bottle of pills. And I said to you, this is 99% effective in making you look 10 years younger. Well, that's a pretty, sounds pretty good, doesn't it? 99% effective to make me look younger. Sounds pretty enticing to me. But what about if I told you that 10,000 people have died from using this product? Would you then go, oh, no, I'm not going to have it. So the first time I'll go, oh, maybe it was 99%. Most people are 10, 10 years younger. I think I'll have that without giving any other information about the people that have died by having it. So the sequence and what you're deleting and how you're structuring that information is crucial. And so our brains, we need to understand 
what this information around us is telling us and what we need to decipher to be the truth for us. And so even in naming things differently, so you can name things that are enticing by saying something is healthy when it actually isn't healthy. So, for instance, right now, you could say, if I said you want an injection, that's well, the first thing I think of is, oh, don't want that. But if I said, do you want a booster? You might be going, oh, that sounds pretty good. It might boost me up. Just the language changes the way you feel about saying yes or no to something. So language is really important, how we name things. Now, the other thing is the perception of how we see things. I talked about this before. We often think that what we see is all there is. So I want to share my screen again. And I want to show you a couple of photos. So the first photo is this one. Now, it's a little bit graphic. I should have mentioned this before. So this is a lion with a baby lion in its mouth. Or is it? This is the other angle. So it shows you that what you see is not necessarily, firstly, what the actual truth is. It is your perception of the truth. You can have right in front of you, you can see that line. That line has that, that cub in its mouth. It's got it in its mouth. It will probably eat that, that little cub. But then you look at the other angle, you go, oh, it's just a mum carrying this little baby. That's all it is. And so perception is everything. And again, us understanding that we can question everything around us, question all the information that we have around us. Now, there's one more exercise I want to do with you guys. So you've got to get a pen and paper. And I was quite surprised at doing this with a few people the other day, how quickly they got it. So I'm guessing that you're pretty intelligent and you'll probably get it quick, maybe even quicker than these other guys. So what I'll do is I'm going to give you the same timing that I gave the other guys. So I want you to get a pen and paper. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a word and what you need to do is unscramble the letters, all of the letters, and make another word with that word. So you have to use all the letters of this word and make another word with it. Pretty simple? Perfect. So I'm going to give you the same amount of time that I've given these other guys that got it fairly quickly. So the first word is whirl. W-H-I-R-L, whirl. Perfect. I gave you the same amount of timing. The next one is slapstick. S-L-A-P. S T I C K, slap stick. Go for it. Beautiful. I'm sure you've both have got, got both of those words. So the last one, this is even harder, is Cinerama. C-I-N-E-R-A-M-A. -A. Go for it. Beautiful. How did we go? Now, I'm guessing, I'm really good at guessing, that some of you 
Maybe all of you are feeling quite frustrated right now. Because when I gave you the first word, world, now hands up who got the right answer, will. What was the word that you got? Well, the interesting thing is you wouldn't have got any word unless you made it up because there is no word that you can make out of world. So it was like a decoy for you guys, right? So you might have thought, hold on a minute. The other guys got it. They got it quick. They got it in this time frame. And then maybe you gave up. And then you went to the next one, slapstick. And it freaking happened again. You couldn't get it. Why couldn't you get it? Maybe I'm not good at this. And so maybe, just maybe, what, what may have happened is the third one, you may have thought to yourself, I'm not good at this. I'm not good at scram um, scrambling words. And so maybe you tried differently. Maybe you gave up sooner because you thought you weren't good at it. Where the last one you could do because you could unscramble it, which the word would have been American. Now, this exercise is built to prove the point about learned helplessness. It's when you decide that I can't do this based on all this evidence of I couldn't do it once, I couldn't do it twice. You're comparing to yourself to others. The others could do it quicker. Well, I should have been able to do it quick. Maybe I'm not good at it. And it happened once, it happened twice. Well, the third time, I'm probably not going to be good at it. And so therefore, you suddenly give up sooner than what you could have. So it's a great exercise to understand how our brain works and how it can trick us. Because I'm sure if I gave you guys Cinerama first, you would have been more open to thinking that you could do it and you probably would have got American. And even just there's so many learnings in just that one little exercise of what was going in your brain, what was going on in your brain as you were doing that exercise, how maybe you were frustrated, what you were thinking, I'm not good at this, that self-talk, what were you saying? So it's a great little exercise to do and to learn about learned helplessness. So it's really important to be the master of our brains. Our brains are what we make our decisions on. Our brains navigate our life. It's our brains that help us achieve some amazing things in life or it's our brain that sometimes tricks us and gives us lets us focus on stuff that we shouldn't be focusing on and taking us away from our goals. So it's so important to, to be the master of our minds, to protect what's going in there, to ask questions, to be mindful of what we're putting in our brains and what we don't want to look at. I don't watch the news, for instance. So really being disciplined in regards to what goes in our brains and understanding as much as we can how our brains work. I trust that's been valuable for you. And I leave you with the saying, be the master of your brain. Thanks, guys.